Okay, welcome back, everybody. We hope you enjoyed the parallel sessions today and enjoyed a nice break in the sun and feel refreshed. So here we are now onto our concluding panel discussion uh, where we'll discuss how to achieve the four per thousand goals. And the idea here is that we'll bring forward the main takeaway messages from the three parallel sessions today and we'll be having discussions around those. So we're really happy to have five fantastic panelists for this discussion today. Uh, so first of all, Claire Chenu, who is a research director at INRAE, the Nas National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and the Environment of France, who will be discussing the takeaway messages from parallel session one on healthy soils for climate, biodiversity, and water. Uh, we also have with us Yuso Yona, who's a farmer at Tinella Farm, also educator, researcher, and board member of the Baltic Sea Action Group, who will present the highlights from Parallel Session 2 on soil carbon monitoring, reporting, and verification. We also have with us Virgita Vainio Matila, who's a ministerial advisor from the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry of Finland. She will discuss the main conclusions of parallel session three on regional priority in Northern Europe, agricultural organic soils or peatlands. Uh, then we have Eskild Andersen, who's senior ESG manager at Carlsberg Group, uh, to bring the business perspective into this discussion. And Anna Kriz, oh, I forgot to ask you about your pronunciation of your name. I'm so sorry in advance. Okay, let's try this. Uh, Ooh. Maybe. <laughs> I, I will really... introduce myself. <laughs> can you can you please say your name and I'll try to repeat it. Of probably. course, it's Anna Krzywoszyńska. Also known as Anna K, Anna Alphabet, <laughs> Anna Polalainen, Anna Unpronounceable. I'm so sorry for this. Krzywoszyńska, I think. <laughs> anyway, Anna, <laughs> who's here with us, who's associate professor at University of Ulu. Uh, to bring the research and science perspective to this panel. Uh, so we can first give a round of applause to all our panelists for joining us. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, so starting with you, Claire, we're really curious to hear uh, what you gathered from the parallel session one today on healthy soils for climate, biodiversity, and water. What were, in your opinion, you know, the main takeaways of the session? Well, the main take yes, uh, the main takeaways of the sessions we frame them as recommendations, maybe mainly for policymakers. And the first one would be to promote carbon sequestration in soils. Well, we, you will not be surprised, but for the many benefits it brings to the environment, to the ecosystem, not only for climate change mitigation. And to do that uh, by promoting practices, uh, carbon storing practices that uh, belong to agroecology including regenerative agriculture, and via co-creation of these management options between farmers, researchers, and other stakeholders. And second, to do that, what is needed is to further develop, develop the training for farmers and advisors, uh, again, uh, encompassing the whole multifunctionality of soils, and to foster networking about, uh, among farmers. It was very clear in the presentations that farmers were always putting forward uh, how networking is important for peer-to-peer -peer learning, exchanging experiences, learning from each other. Um, aside from soil carbon, it was clear in the session that uh, drainage, soil compaction and drainage are problems uh, that are standing and that should be recognized and solved. Um, that's in terms of practices and uh, outcomes, uh, there's a need to promote high diversity plant communities, again, for the many benefits, including additional soil carbon uh, storage, um, and to support long-term field studies and long-term field experiments because changes in soil takes time and there's a need to account for the diversity of pedoclimatic conditions and land uses. So these were the main takeaways uh, well, we would like to dedicate them to address them to policymakers in particular, but more generally as well. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the framing in terms of recommendations to policymakers as well. I think that's really helpful. And feel free in your responses also, uh, Yuso and Birgitta, uh, to 
frame it as, you know, is this uh, particularly relevant to any type of stakeholders? Um, so thank you for that, Claire. So uh, following with you, Yuso, uh, what do you think were the main takeaways today in parallel session two on uh, soil carbon monitoring, reporting, and verification? Thanks. First of all, MRV is crucial when carbon sequestration is monetized either by markets or subsidized. And uh, during the last five years, common idea of the framework has developed, including measurements, modeling, and calculation methods. And this is based a lot of uh, for uh, Pete Smith's picture you see in the session referred many times where this framework is, is visualized. Um, though there is uh, several different uh, models and projects going uh, throughout the Europe, only in Europe there is, of course, then back in the US there is several others in North America as well. Uh, so this needs maybe coordination further to make these different models more comparable. And uh, this heterogeneity is not only a negative issue uh, because it allows these comparisons between these different models and try to get the best out of them all. Uh, and in practice, um, for example, Christian Holzleiner told about this EU carbon removal certification scheme uh, these different models could serve in practice this, uh, and we need common understanding uh, for these purposes. Christian told, told that uh, only one methodology could be used for one activity, so that maybe needs more development to find the best ones to serve best this issue. There is also new promising technologies uh, coming in, which may help to more handle this huge variation we have in the field, more precise uh, results coming out. And from the farmer's point of view, uh, which I gave, uh, I would like to stress that uh, it need, the system needs to be reliable, uh, easily accessible, and uh, easy to use as well. So uh, at, at best there would be one model, one system where to deliver the input data from the farming operations because now farmers are uh, anyway having their farming planning and bookkeeping and uh, it should not take any extra effort to uh, transfer this data to other interface though these interfaces then should be uh, connected and, and uh, sharing the same language and uh, discussing with each other. And I think these were the main points and we can discuss further later. Thank you, Yusu. I really appreciate this. Um, and yeah, this is such a you know a, a technical, a technological challenge, and it's so crucial also to help advance our understanding of you know what is there in the soil currently, what is the impact of our of our practices. And it really seems like you know five years ago we didn't have much of an answer on that. And it's interesting to see that different research groups have moved forward in, in similar direction, but there is definitely a lot more to be done. So thank you for summarizing that. Um, now moving on to you, Virgita, um, I'm really curious to hear from your perspective, what do you think were the main conclusions of Parallel Session 3 on peatlands? Yes, thank you. First of all, I can totally agree with these two previous speakers because they were the same kind of things that came out also in, in, in our group. And it was really interesting to hear uh, all the presentations, they were really good and uh, many special things from different countries, from, from Estonia, Denmark, Germany, and so on, that what those, in those countries is happening with these peatlands. And I think it was in quite many presentations also that there was this map and we, we could see that there are a lot of peatlands in agricultural use in Finland. So that's why it, it, it's so highly discussed also in Finland when we talk about the emissions from, the, from agriculture. But there was a good 
question from the audience that what we are talking about when we talk about the peatlands, what's the definition for the peatland? So there is IP, IPCC definition for peatlands. I think many countries might use their own national definition for that, but it should be clear that when we talk about the peatlands and measures what we do there, that what kind of the land is, because I think it's that if you do the same measure in different peatland, the result might be <coughs> different. How thick is the peat layer, layer and so on? What's the moisture content and, and all that kind of thing? So that was some kind of basic question which came out. And we also heard a lot of about the research. We need more research, location of peatland state structure, impact of different measures in different conditions, also climatic conditions. So there isn't one model that suits every country, but the measures we have to take, also the local conditions, they play a quite a big role there. And Claire said about the long-term experiments. That's something what, what is needed, that in one presentation there is that they had an experiment for six years, and, and she said that six years isn't long, long, enough long time to see the results, what's happening in the soil. And that's something that we are trying to do in Finland so that we could have measurements even in different projects, but continue then the next one when one stops so that we get this long-term long experiment. Also, the user mentioned this MRE modeling calculation. It's something that we should work more so that we know more. When we are telling to farmers that this is a good thing to do, so we have to have the really good information of that, that if farmer does this, so it's the result is the good, that we don't come back after a couple of years and no, that wasn't the right thing to do. You should do this in a different way. About then the research, there was also a good comment that we should have social scientists in the research group. How do humans behave? We have a lot of research where are also farmers are really included and they know there are experiments on their field, but then when we think about the whole country or bigger group of farmers, that how people behave, how they change their <coughs> habits to do things and, and so on. So I think that was really a good point also. We have a lot of discussion about the revetting peatlands, but also then the paludiculture. And with paludiculture, we mean now that we produce biomass from the field where the water, groundwater level is, is raised. And we saw also that the paludiculture is needed. It's quite challenging, but there are a lot of possibilities. We need more sustainable biomass to replace fossil-based by um, fossil-based materials products. And also there was mentioned that paludiculture can um, act also like the adaptation measure for agriculture. There was this water smart paludiculture. So with paludiculture, it might be possible to control the water level if it's dry or if it's raining too much, so then we can control the water. So there are a lot of, a lot of potential and possibilities, but we are maybe just in the beginning to try to uh, try to create the value chain for the paludiculture support system a lot of discussion of that we should improve our support system of course common agricultural policy but also think then different kind of national system if it's possible to have those and there was a discussion about this um, result based support and different kind of Things, but uh, I have to say that in Finland, in our cup system, there are now possibilities like to do paludiculture in certain group of plants, and we have also this non-productive support for create uh, climate wetlands and things like that. So I think we are going to the right way, but uh, there is more to do. There was one comment from the audience that we should get rid of this, um, is it now single payment perus tulotuki? Is it single payment? Yes. <laughs> it, payment. It's, it's the basic payment in the CAP. And what else? All dimensions of sustainability have to be taken. So we are today talking a lot of environment, but we must think or take also a notion to the social and economical issues. So it's something that it's, we can't do everything just thinking environment, but there are also then these social and economical things. And it's a new way of thinking. It takes time. We should start with different kind of pilots, and there is a lot of pilots going on. 
Thank you. Thank you, Birgitta. Um, the, you know, peatlands, the question of peatlands is such an important issue in northern countries. So, yeah, thank you very much for summarizing this. Um, fantastic. Well, so now moving on to you, Eskild. Um, I'm curious to hear, you know, do you have any reactions uh, to what you just heard was discussed in the three parallel sessions? And from your perspective, you know, from the business perspective, how might that influence your work and your, your business decisions? Yes, uh, thank you. So first of all, I would like to say it's been really fantastic to be here for the last two days and attending a conference that's a little bit different to what I normally attend. So it's, uh, I, I really appreciate that, that all the knowledge and expertise that is in, in the rooms that I have visited. So, so thank you for that. Uh, so my perspective on the, so I was predominantly in the measurement, the MRW, what it was, what it was, what? MRB. Carbon, yeah. Um, so um, I think that, that one thing that has been, from a business point of view, clear is that regenerative agriculture is coming. And that's, uh, I'm very pleased about that because we also have a, a target in Carlsberg that we would like to go in that direction. So we have said that by 2030, 30% uh, of all the raw materials that we are using in our products should come from regenerative agriculture. And in 2040, it should be 100%. But having said that, uh, following the discussions also, is also clear that uh, if we want to communicate any carbon benefits, we are not really there yet. So we should really be, be very careful about what we can claim uh, when it comes to, to product. I think we can be proud on communicating that we are doing a, uh, supporting a transformation by requesting uh, regenerative agriculture. But uh, what I've learned from the last discussions is that maybe the, the, the carbon benefits are not really tangible enough to, to, be, to be put on, on product. And that's also lead me to, to the next point is that, that and then we should be very careful not to to take some, some easy wins and, and, and do greenwashing in, in this space. So really be, be careful uh, around that. So, 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 but that's really where I think there is a balance for business because one is that, that on the one side uh, there is a lot of uncertainty still. There are still a lot of things that we need to measure. There are a lot of technologies that are not there yet, still need to be done, do we, uh, still, uh, need to be done a lot. On the other hand, I don't think there's time to wait till everything is right. So we also need to start moving. So, so that's balance we need as business to strike. Thank you. Uh, yeah, very interesting points. You know, it's, uh, we're, we're kind of building the plane as it's already flying, and we can't wait to have everything in place to move forward. So there's already actions we can take. Thank you for this, Eskild. Um, and uh, Anna, how about yourself? Uh, do you have any reactions to what you heard about the three par parallel sessions? And uh, yeah, how might you incorporate this in, in your work as a, as a professor and researcher? Thanks very much. And first of all, congratulations on a wonderful event. I hope it becomes an annual event because one of my key takeaways is the value of these spaces. So we have spoken a lot about regenerative agriculture as a transformation, technological transformation. But of course, what it is, first of all, primarily, it's a social transformation. With regenerative agriculture, we are talking about fundamentally changing the way that we relate to land, that we do farming, that we do agriculture, that we think about society. So potentially, the repercussions of regenerative agriculture as a social transformation are huge. And this is what I have found in my own work, interviewing regenerative farmers who have gone through this transition, the process of starting from the focus on the technical and ending up with a transformation of their entire livelihood and their entire farming culture, this is very, very big. And um, my first point, therefore, is to, uh, or my first takeaway, and I have especially heard this unsurprisingly from the people who work sort of on the coal face with the farmers themselves, representing agroecology groups, representing regenerative farmers, 
there is a real desire to embrace this social transformation as part of regenerative agriculture. And that links to uh, the other point, which is about research. Uh, so I'm an interdisciplinary social science researcher. I hang out a lot with natural scientists. I'm a science officer in the International Union of Soil Sciences. How I might manage that, I don't know. Like I infiltrated and I'm, now I'm in and they can't get rid of me. Um, so the interdisciplinarity of this research is uh, really a need. And uh, we have seen a talks about fantastic uh, technological innovation. But again, regenerative agriculture is also social innovation, economic innovation, and cultural innovation. And these are the aspects that also deserve our attention. They deserve our funding. And the, um, that also <laughs> means addressing the structural barriers that scientists face when trying to engage with regenerative agriculture as a subject. Because at the moment, the way that our scientific lives are structured, especially in natural sciences, push researchers away from field-based research. And fortunately, and this I'm saying with my uh, hat as a member of the mission uh, Soil Health for Europe, um, there are now models emerging, such as living labs, which are really trying to bring science back to the field. And I think we need more of these models, and we need, really need to think about how groups such as the Baltic Sea Action Group and other organizations who have spoken up can bring their resources together to be a voice that can actually ally, especially with early career researchers who want to pursue socially and ecologically relevant research rather than just sit behind closed doors of the laboratory. So this is also a call for the farming community, for groups such as this, to engage proactively with science from a range of disciplines and, and to help build these kinds of knowledges. Absolutely. Um, thanks very much for this, Anna. And I couldn't agree more. You know, it's, it's of course, we talk about this as being uh, you know, a technical issue, and yes, there are technical challenges, but it's first and foremost a, a social challenge um, to change behaviors, change practices, uh, and yes, the Living Labs is such a, a fantastic format to kind of integrate science and practice at the same time. So thank you for this. I see a reaction right away from you, so, so <laughs> please Thanks, go Deborah. ahead. Great points. Thanks, Anna. I first would like to grab on this on-farm research issue you just pointed out. And Carbon Action is a model and example of that. And I have to uh, mention that we've been conducting with Tuomas Mattila on-farm research several years and now published even a blog ab about on-farm research. And in the end of the season, there will be out a guide on on-farm research. And Tuomas can now post the address to our event platform. But secondly, <clears throat> Anna discussed about the conversion and the paradigm shift towards regenerative agriculture. And there was also yesterday some discussion about this conversion and change that it, some told that it, it can be expensive and, and costly for the farmer. Uh, but I would like to challenge that uh, because I see that the continuing the current degenerative practices and farming is much more costly and much more expensive than thinking of the change and the con conversion. And this change in farm level can be conducted by uh, trials and trialing things, new methods and piloting them and then step by step driving them into a whole, whole farm system. Uh, I have to tell an example from our carbon action setup where those 100 pilot farmers were instructed to make a, a three hectare trial plot divided for a control plot and, and, and a test plot. And the first year, it took a lot of effort to hold them on, staying on, on this one, uh, um, one practice that they were trialing there until we find out with Tuomas that actually we can allow them to do everything more and else outside this trial and on their farm. And, and now actually many farms have 
turned in the region, they have done a lot of development outside this trial plot. I think there is more carbon sequestration coming in uh, the soil outside trial plots, but that's just a good thing in this case. Thank you, Yuso. Uh, yeah, very interesting perspective. Um, so I saw also, Claire, you were taking a lot of notes. I wonder if you, if you have any reactions to what has been discussed so far. Well, I'm taking notes because I was thinking it was very interesting <laughs> what was being said. And one thing I was thinking, uh, thank you, Anna, for your comments, is that is I do think that we absolutely need to increase the research capacity on soils. And for that, we need to attract non-soil scientists to study soils. And this is a real challenge. Well, to attract economists, social scientists, specialists of policy, of uh, psychology. Um, and this is not that easy. And actually, in the European Joint Program, I'm coordinating, this is something we wanted to do. And so we, in our complex roadmap process, we wrote topics that were at the interface between the multidisciplinary and the interface between social science and soil sciences. And these were not that well evaluated within our consortium with the program owners. Well, we didn't make it well. We have a few, several projects doing soil science, but well, less than I anticipated, I hoped, I wanted. So I think we need to make an effort and, and maybe to, yes, I think what's one of the bias we have is that sometimes it is soil scientists or agronomist designing so-called social science research questions. And Thank we are not you. able to do that. We're not good at that. So we need you much ahead, much before that. I, I'm, I'm working on cloning. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll contact you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you so, if I may jump in. Please thank do. you so much. This is a really uh, wonderful comment. I'm going to do a little bit of a plug um, because I have created a sort of a space where uh, crazy people like myself who are social scientists but are interested in soil can, can come together and also connect with others. It's called the Soil Care Network, soilcarenetwork.com. Please join us. We have a fun newsletter and a mailing list that really allows you to connect with others, whether you're a natural scientist, a farmer, or a social scientist, or an artist. It's a really great community to plug into, and a lot of collaborations and connections have already come out of it. But creating these hybrid places is hard. And it really is because scientists, be that in social sciences, in arts and humanities, or in natural sciences, are not institutionally incentivized to do interdisciplinary work. For all the talk that we have, it still doesn't happen. So, um, so this, is, you know, this is maybe not so relevant if you're listening as a farmer, you're thinking, well, why do I care? <laughs> but we would really, we, I think we would really, um, there is a lot of social scientists and natural scientists who really want to do this kind of work, who, wants to do so, who want to do socially impactful work and building a stronger justification for the social impact of research is one way of ensuring that interdisciplinary research happens. And this is somewhere where, where Baltic Sea Action Group has actually a lot of power and you can do great things to, to bring that more up the agenda in Finland. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Birgitta, would you like to comment? Yes. Thank, thank you. It feels that we need change in all levels, on the farmer level, research, and so in the whole food system. And uh, I'm just wondering that you said that uh, in Carlsberry you will have 100% all the raw material will be, was it 2040, will be yeah. produced after these regenerative agricultural measures. But then, and you also say that farmers say that it's expensive to change the system. So is it possible? So it's not expensive. Not expensive. Okay, I heard expensive. Good to know. Okay. <laughs> Good to know because I was just going to ask that how you see that. Uh, is it possible that the farmer get better money out from the market if he produce after these regenerative agricultural measures? And I have to also mention here that we have talking about the farmers and research and also then us politicians. But I think like in Finland, I have to say that we have really active food industry, which is working also in this here, in this carbon action ground. And I think it, they do really important work because they have then, they buy product from the farmers and they have really close connections and they try to advise the farmers that how they should do and in different 
parts of the country. So I think it's like a change in the whole food system is actually needed. Mm -hmm. It's not only the farmer or as in politicians. <laughs> or now, now I'm not politicians, I come from the ministry, but then, then uh, yeah, I have to say this also now when I, mean, I remember that when you work in the ministry, it's quite difficult to explain to the politicians that like when we work in the soil, we can get results in a half a year, or even it might be that they ask, now you have the money, why do you haven't done anything with that? Because it's quite a big system to get the money out and then get the results. So it's not one government, it's quite many governments that we have to do these things. And now we have all kind of uh, like a uh, climate plan for the land use sector, and it's something that it goes over the government times, and it's like a long term. Mm -hmm. program. Thank you. Absolutely. That's certainly a, a challenge. Um, I think Anna and, and Yusu, you, you both uh, had comments, it looks like. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to come back to this question of uh, the transition not being costly. Absolutely. Financially, it can not be costly. What it always is, is socially costly and psychologically costly for the farmers undergo this because still being a regenerative agriculture farmer we, we in this room may think that this is somehow a norm it really isn't <laughs> like it really isn't and um the far in the, within the farming community doing something different um especially doing something different that is very visually different that people can look over your head and say why aren't you plowing or your field looks messy you're not a good farmer anymore that that's really um that's really costly so the importance of the community that can support people who are interested in doing the transition, this is a research finding from my research, this is not just anecdotal, um, this is something that is absolutely needed. And that's why I was kind of hoping that this event can become an annual event, that it can be broadened beyond carbon to agri-environmental transformation, because that's kind of what we're talking about, and really become a space where um, farmers who are thinking, because many of them are now thinking that something needs to change, can come and meet others who have already gone a little bit further and and start thinking about how this can happen. Maria, I can't see her right now, but her story of the transformative impact of just being taken into a different landscape and seeing what the possibilities are is just such a brilliant example of of that being really necessary. Thank you. Yeah, I would like to also refer to Maria Ösch's story because like Maria yesterday told that he, she or at least me neither earlier didn't have vision or, or images that what is a good soil, how does a biodiverse environment, the field look like, that there is no, for me it's that we don't have weeds, we have a, a companion plants or crops in, in the mixtures. Some do cause some harm, but most are useful. And uh, that is mostly about changing the mindset. Uh, you can turn into a, convert into a region of agriculture in one night if you want to. Then it's about how you see things, how you do things. And I haven't heard any negative side effects from the farmers who have converted into region or taking path towards region agriculture. Uh, this is more definition things. But, but it's, it's really a psychological uh, conversion. Uh, and farmers need incentives and encouragement in this phase when they turn into that. There is all typically habi habits or common things that they've been doing like, like my father or grandfather did. And that's the, the barrier actually. So the incentives, the money talks of course. So the payments from the companies to extra uh, for the products, uh, but also subsidies, which is now steering a lot uh, to agricultural policy. And if, if it's so huge money, and mainly those direct payments, Birgitta told, that they are based on area or, or animal number, so there's no any incentive to go towards, at least Finland and many other EU countries didn't utilize those possibilities that uh, Commission offered 2018, uh, the eco schemes are very poorly adopted and, and also 
in Finland, the environmental subsidy system. There's a lo lot of nice things in, but there's nothing that is additional. That is a good criteria for the things we do in general and in, in carbon sequestration and in policy. That is there any additional things in that, or are those just the things that farmers, for example, are doing anyway? Basically. Uh, yeah, so, so to the questions about the, the cost and the uh, payment of, of uh, raw materials uh, for regenerative uh, agriculture, uh, I have participated in, in quite some number of meetings where this question comes always, and that's a fair question to ask. Uh, and I said, from our point of view, we are aware that all the things that need to happen will have a price, and we are also willing to, to do something in, uh, to make that transition happen. But it's also important to say that there is also uh, benefits that goes the other way. Uh, so we, we cannot cover uh, everything on, on our own. So you need to drive less for your tracks, so you also need to use less fertilizer and so on. So there's also benefits that goes the other way. So, but yes, to your question, we are, we are ready to, to, to look into that. And, and, but it's really, really be to, to have a discussion with, uh, with the suppliers that we are having. So what can they deliver and what is worth for us? So that's how, how we look at it. So, but yes, indeed, there will be a transition cost to, to this. We see that as well. Thank you. Um, and now, before we jump to audience questions, uh, I think we, it might be interesting to leave on the following notes. Um, I'm always curious, you know, ending events like this, because we, we're so many different kinds of stakeholders, we come from such different realities. Um, from your perspective, in your own work, uh, you know, leaving this event, going back to work, what is, you know, one of the main challenges you feel you'll have to overcome uh, in the next while regarding, you know, this transition to soil regeneration? And you can also, we, we'd love to hear also about one thing that makes you particularly hopeful, you know, what's one big opportunity um, in that regard. Uh, so perhaps, Anna, would you like to start? Yeah, one hope, one, one challenge you have to uh, face in your work and something that makes you hopeful. I don't know about challenges. I've been doing everything right so far. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the real challenge is uh, convincing... For, this is, yeah, this is, okay, so very much within my work. This is really about um, pushing the value of interdisciplinary research on the soil health transition, on the agricultural transition on social regeneration, whatever you want to call this. Um, and, but for me, that what that means in practice is uh, connecting with farmers and farmer organizations who are already doing this work and actually using my expertise and my connections to amplify that. So that's what I will continue <laughs> focusing on in my, in my work. And what makes me hopeful is that it has become normalized to talk about regenerative agriculture. It is amazing how quickly this happened. Within the last three years, it, this has become a term that we can now use, that is recognizable, and perhaps it has become a bit of a buzzword, but we can utilize this buzzword for good ends. So that re really is a great opportunity. Absolutely, thank you for this. Eskild. Uh, yeah, just to build on that. Um, so what gives me hope uh, in this area is that so when we were launching our new strategy last year in August, uh, it's called Together Towards Earn Beyond, where we had included these targets on regenerative agriculture, it was an, an, a new thing uh, for the Casper Group. What gives me hope is that we are now seeing the markets, and we are in a lot of different markets, they are now starting to take this challenge on board to see how can we start to implement this. And we now see there is uh, projects ongoing in, in, in the UK. Uh, we have uh, projects, uh, investigating projects in Denmark, in, this, in Sweden. And uh, we also have a project in, in France already running even before we started the, the, our, our strategy. And then uh, we also have, uh, also for quite some number of years also in Finland, actually produced a Christmas brew with regenerative agriculture. So it's available on the shelf in December. So just go and buy it, right? Because that is already out there. So there's hope. Uh, we are already starting a transition, and we are not even one year uh, within our, our sustainability program. 
Thank you, Eskild. Uh, Birgitta, would you have any, any thoughts? So, yeah, any thoughts? Maybe a hope for a good thing. I have worked quite a long time in the ministry, and maybe it's because I'm working with a sustainable food system and what we do every day, four or five times we eat. We still need food also in the future. And I think that's still the main task of the agriculture, produce safety and nutritious food, but we can do it in different way. And I think we have, like in Finland, quite a lot of many things going on and the discussion is sometimes it's a little bit how you say too hard that there are people say that you shouldn't eat meat and you should eat only vegetables or in some other way. But I think in, in general, the discussion is quite good. And it's what's good for climate, it's also good for your health. And in a couple of weeks, we will get new Nordic food or, or the nutrition recommendations. And then we see that what's coming there. And I have heard that there is now more of these sustainable things. And also, I don't know it's, if it's hope or what it is, but uh, when you work in the ministry, you work a little bit between the politicians and then the real life. And now we are, there is discussions going on and they like to try to create new government program at the moment. Maybe it will be published ne next week or I don't know when. But I hope that there still is these sustainable issues for the agriculture. During this government period, we have made a lot of work towards more sustainable food system. So that I hope that we can continue with that. And now we are getting results from research and things like that and try to find measures which are just and accept acceptable also the farmers in the fields and, and animal shelters. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Birgitta. Um, would you have any comments uh, on challenges and hopes you saw? Yeah. I, I would like to communicate images from the region of agriculture um, to give a positive future vision to uh, young farmers and becoming farmers, because that is something we are maybe missing currently. And what gives me, gives me hope are children and youth uh, who are much more be better than we are and who are much, many times much more right than we are. Great point. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. And how about you, Claire? Uh, what, what would be your challenge For and me, hope? The challenge would be that we do not become carbon maniacs. I'm a carbon scientist. I'm excited about carbon, but carbon farming definitely should not be only about carbon. There are other elements in soil organic matter, nitrogen, phosphorus, and soil health. Thank you. So health is not only carbon sequestration, not only climate change mitigation. So a much broader view has been, and I'm a bit, uh, yes, for me it's really a challenge that we're facing and that the economic sector even of carbon farming is facing right now. Now hopes, well, to witness uh, initiatives, initiatives of farmers, of NGOs, of groups towards agroecological, the agroecological transition. And also, I would say that souls are becoming much more visible in the public arena and in the p policy arena. Absolutely. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, well, now let's open up to questions from the audience. Does, uh, OK, that sounds I can read it from over here. Is this working? Yeah. OK, good. Great. Thank good you. Thing. Hi. <laughs> How would you phrase the relationships between the concepts of regenerative climate-wise or biodiverse farming? Uh, uh, how would you phrase the relationships between the concepts of regenerative or climate-wise or biodiverse farming? I think that regent agriculture is like an umbrella term. And for me, it's uh, really like uh, based on principles and it's, it's really outcomes oriented. And then all the measures that uh, answers to these targets uh, and uh, desired outcomes are uh, possible to define in the farm scale so that they're the best utilizable practices. Thank you, Yusuf. Do you have anything to say, Claire? Yeah, maybe there was another term I would add is agroecology. And it's all about managing uh, soil and the farm based on ag ecological principles. 
um, based on life, using uh, the capacity of living uh, uh, being. Um, with and whether is it climate wise? Not always, but most often, I guess I think that there is really strong synergies. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else want to comment on that question? Nothing to add. Thank you for this, uh, Una and the person who asked on Eventi. Uh, sir, would you like to ask your question? It's more a comment than a question. Uh, sure. It's on the carbon market, and it's perhaps uh, building up on what Claire said. Um, my name is Werner Kutsch. I'm only a scientist, so I'm a bit naive, perhaps, when it comes to politics and economy. But I'm a bit interested in history, and in particular, how history is repeating itself. And some 500 years ago, we had a problem, which was not a soil problem, but a soul problem. So there was too much sinning in the world. But then there was a nice system that was invented. You could bring your sin to the voluntary sinning market <laughs> and could buy indulgence. Um, and uh, this system, this system uh, worked for some time. Uh, somebody got in Rome, got very rich. Um, but I think it was not very efficient uh, in terms of, of getting uh, the sinning down. And um, now we, I heard today in, in the parallel session where I was, I heard that the, the carbon market potential might be 1,000 billion, 1 trillion in the year 2050. And I think perhaps the history is repeating itself. So um, we have a sin, nowadays it's defined as emission. And then we go and pay something uh, on, the on the carbon market, and then we can continue to sin. The atmosphere sees a constant increase in CO2, so obviously it's not very efficient. So my question, perhaps you can take this up, shouldn't we just forget the market and tax sins, tax emissions, tax other environmental harm, and then we get perhaps a trillion tax income which we can give to farmers, to science, to all kinds of, of transitional things we need. Why do we need this carbon market? Thank you for your question. Any reactions from the panelists? Well, I can after. <laughs> so for me, there's something that uh, to promote the transition towards regenerative agriculture, agroecology, incentives are needed. But it's not compensating emissions elsewhere. For me, that's completely different. It's not carbon market. It's incentivizing uh, what are viewed as positive, good practices, good uh, management options. Yeah, of course, polluter should pay. But without a market, we have this subsidies in Western agriculture. And we should direct these subsidies uh, to ecosystem services, to public goods, not for production, not for area, not for animal number. And that we can use to promote and incentivize regenerative practices in agriculture. Uh, yes, uh, JK, you had a question? Yeah, around this carbon market. Uh, it has fallen apart in 1990s, and I think very likely it will fall apart again. My thought is that instead of carbon credit, why don't we incentivize farmers for doing good things, yes. practicing good practices, following good practices? I think that's what should be the goal. Thank you. Agree. <laughs> Sure, did, good, did you have any good, reactions? Good practices or? could be monitored by measuring carbon. So we come into this circle. Uh, but it's not, and not only, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe quick comment. I work also with this EU carbon credit certification system and, uh, and things related to the carbon market. And it's, 
actually quite complicated system. It might look that it's quite easy, but then when we have this common agricultural policy and support system there, so how we see that, what's the addi additionality of the measure? Is it already written in the legislation? There is a lot of coming EU legislation now, especially concerning the peatlands, that you should revet certain amount of uh, peatlands for certain certain years. So it's where is the room for the carbon market? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something, and then that double counting, I still have huge problems to understand that how it works, but maybe mm -hmm. one day I will know how it happens. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Thank you for this. Uh, so we just have time for one more question. So, Daniel, would you like to go ahead? Well, very quickly, because I'm also impressed by this question of what I call the carbon god uh, that is now uh, more and more uh, important in our society. So, um, indeed, uh, it will be very difficult, probably, as we see, to avoid this carbon market. It's growing and growing. So, one of the challenges that we face is to start identifying all the trade-offs and also risks that we are facing if this carbon market is really taking a lot of space and energy and, and money. Uh, and so such a group, for instance, instead of assuming all the time, oh yes, carbon is, go is good, should we also have maybe some sessions where we start thinking about all these trade-offs and difficulties that we need to anticipate, particularly if we take a more systemic approach, which again I'm pleading for. Uh, so. Yeah, it's maybe a question that we need to ask ourselves. Thank you, Daniel. Any reactions to this? I would very much like to react to this because this is very much what I'm also hearing from the farming community, that there is, um, farmers are very aware of risks and markets are risky. And what we are talking about is a transition that is long-term and the investment that is long-term and the cultural cost that is long-term so thinking about these trade-offs and thinking about regenerative agriculture as something that produces soil carbon as a byproduct of a good food system, that for me, and this is what I am hearing, that this is the direction. And if we can scrounge a bit from Coca-Cola in the meantime, great, but we're mainly just want to produce better food. I think that's what I'm hearing. Thank you, Anna. Uh, are there any other comments to this question? No other comments? Okay, well, thank you so much for such rich discussions. Claire, Yuso, Birgitta, Eskild, Anna. Um, so this concludes our panel. Um, I just have one other comment uh, for this segment is that we would love to hear from you also, the participants, you know, wh whether you're here in Helsinki or online. Um, we would like to propose that you yourselves also tell us what you think, in your opinion, was the main takeaway of the event. Uh, so if you go on Eventi uh, in this session, um, in this current session, you can click on question and within the next 15 to 20 minutes, you have the opportunity to tell us what you think were the main uh, conclusions of the event and we'd really like to hear from you. And all of this will be compiled into the, the final report also of the event. So this will be really interesting um, data and information for us. So thank you in advance. So please give a, a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you so much. Um, and so now we actually have a little surprise act to end the day in a more interactive way. Um, so I'd like to invite on stage Laura Heuer and uh, Yuso Yuna, who will come back, uh, for them to give us a demo of soil health. So thank you for this. Looking forward to it. Yuso is Thomas coming also. So I guess what is going to happen now is that we are bringing the very special, uh, special guest in. The guest of honor is coming on stage soon. But I'm not telling more. Something is happening. Okay. Maybe we keep a, little, a little bit of silence to give this. 
Okay, uh, it takes a minute. So actually, in meanwhile, we could actually now uh, go uh, this evening. We are going to have a very nice session in the evening. Uh, so maybe Tula, if we use this time wisely, so Tula, I ask you to come on stage. And if we can have the slide about the event tonight, that many of you know already, but, but Tula is kind enough to tell more about this very special events. You're welcome, Tula. So let them do what they do. Yeah. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so I thank you for the opportunity to uh, advertise this side event that will start in one hour. And I'm Tula Larmola from Natural Resources Institute Finland and our team will host this event. So it's, it's about paludiculture cooking, so cooking from wetland plants. And um, there will be three chefs that will create something new f out of uh, cattail, bulbrush, uh, taifa plant. And then there will be also small snacks from uh, more conventional wetland plants, such as berries. And why are we organizing this? This is part of a project on paludiculture that is uh, led by Professor Christina Long. And the idea in this project is to uh, have farmers, co farmer communities to pilot on climate smart management, including paludiculture. And of course, you need markets for these paludiculture projects. So one part is to match the farmers with, with the companies. And um, of course, uh, you would need innovations in all sectors where you could use these paludiculture materials. And now in our event, we will then showcase this in the food sector. Um, so here you have the link. You can look more information about the project. And uh, now then some practical things. Uh, so we will meet in half an hour. Uh, there will be a bus transportation for the first 50 that signed up. So we reached 50 people uh, by yesterday night. But everybody else is also welcome. Uh, but then you would just need to use the public transportation to get to the site. And Yes, the address is up there, um, and it's uh, also quite easy to get there by tram, so you would need to walk some uh, 100 meters, maybe less than half, half a kilometer northwards here to reach tram 4, then you take that to Opera, and there you change to tram 8, take uh, six stops, and then walk another uh, 500 meters. So maybe with the help of Google Map, or, or if you are local and you know quite easily how to get there. So there's room for more than 50. We just um, weren't sure how many would join, and that's why we had only one bus. Um, and well, so for the, uh, the bus will come at the main door. So. I will meet you there, out, I think, outdoors, in front of the uh, door, and that will be 5.05. And now if there's anyone who signed up but cannot join us, um, uh, I would uh, please let me know, because then <laughs> that will <laughs> free one seat in the bus. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Tula. Very clear instructions. As you know, we are not ending. Many of you will continue tomorrow. We will have excellent field trips. So maybe uh, you, so Joona and Tuomas Mattila, our great ca carbon action farmers and advisors and researchers, you have many hats. But you're going to do this in Kvidia, maybe, not maybe this, but something similar. But not everybody are coming on field trips. So we want to have all of you to enjoy this soil experiments, how you do call it, yeah, but we, the stage is yours. No, no, we ate Thank all you. the bread and the chocolate cake, so we had to bring real soil to this class. Yeah, <clears throat> and I want to tell a funny story which is related to interdisciplinarity research. Interdisciplinary research. 
So <clears throat> for the farmer's point of view, there are really like two questions. What's wrong with this field and how to fix it? And we had a project where we tried to ask this question and approach it in a scientific way. And one of the farmers, we asked, asked the farmer, like, what's wrong with this field? And he said that the field is pretty okay unless it rains. If it rains, the soil structure just collapses and it's a mess. And we measured all kinds of stuff and couldn't pinpoint the problem. And then, like, first year of the project goes and second year of the project goes and we can't find what's wrong. And third year of the project comes and it rains a lot and the field collapses completely. And then we come to the farmer, hey, we know what's wrong with this field. When it rains, it collapses completely. <laughs> and the farmer was, yes. <laughs> now, how do we fix it? <laughs> so it's, it's, sometimes the problems the farmers have are really difficult to pinpoint, like what's actually going on. And I think this simple test, which you've seen many times in these slides, is one of the best ways to kind of get to the same level as the farmer to kind of get to understanding, that, oh, when it gets wet, something happens. Let's see what happens. We have two different, uh, two soils from different fields. Uh, this one is from our soil level ag agro trial where we are trialing plowing and comparing it with uh, minimized tillage. So it's been plowed last three years and this is winter wheat growing there. And uh, Plowing is not typical in our farm. This is clay soil, some silt in it, maybe uh, clay percent somewhere around 30 or 40. This one is uh, from a field which has uh, 20 species green manure or soil improvement clay. Here we see red clover, there's some white clover underneath, and uh, from the neighboring field, Coxfoot, Trefoil, and there's alfalfa, Lutzerna roots you see there. So same type of soil, couple of hundred meters apart from, from each other. And uh, I would say that this soil have had a kind of positive uh, circle going on several years. So good crops, good soil health. And now uh, actually it, it, it's its first years of, of this lay and it will continue two years. And this have had a kind of negative circle in, in this field. So let's see what happens when we pour some water uh, very gently first. Something starts to happen and it goes like it should. This plowed soil with not that good uh, aggregate stability starts to <coughs> lose soil. You see there's a lot of uh, turbidity coming out, a lot of soil particles, a lot of uh, also particle phosphorus. So, so one common argument is that Finland has lots of erosion because it's so wet. So true, false. <laughs> Both are wet, yes. <laughs> and, and these have had only, I, I repeat, only one year this lay. The previous crop was oats and we he, he saw some straw there and because I want to show these because these are kind of equal. I mean, this one here in the box, these have had uh, the same cream and lay already three years, and now it looks like this. And we didn't choose this one because this would have not collapsed but fall into pieces. If we would it's have so crumbly, it this yeah. sieve is so small, it would have kind of fallen through it. Would you, Thomas, like to? Uh, yeah, thanks. So I would like to do this, and it's easy, easily crushed with our hands. We're making a bit mess, but we're leaving soon. Uh, <laughs> this one is alfalfa. Don't Lutzerne. throw us out yet. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is really nice, nice root penetrating the compacted layers. And what's going on here? This is continuing the collapse. So now summer is over. It's it's raining soon next couple of months. What happens then? Let's should, pour. Should we put the shower head on? And make a little more mess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> we're leaving soon. Uh, let's see. <laughs> let's destroy the hotel. Yeah. Never have this event again. <laughs> yeah. And it impores the 
There's reaction. so much erosion in Finland because it rains. Mm. And this, true, not yeah. true. <laughs> this cafe latte type of water is running to the Baltic Sea every uh, uh, September, October, November, December, even January, February. There were huge uh, re precipitation last uh, February, I would say. In, in one day there were more uh, phosphorus runoff than in one or two months or whole year. It was huge. Yeah. When the soils were bare, like mostly in this case, uh, this is what happens. And this is no good. We want to have this kind of soils. So take home message from this is that uh, soil should be covered and at least this clay should not be plowed. But what happens when comes earthquake? Let's try it. Ah, yes. <laughs> Always be ready for. Yeah. Not so common in Finland yet, but climate is changing. <laughs> this stands tall, this not. Any questions? Uh, and if you want to see an experiment in the real world, uh, you can look at Sentinel Playground, which has satellite imagery every four days, and have a look at Helsinki, uh, coast of Helsinki in October and coast of Helsinki in March. You can see like which stereotype is visible there. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> We are taking patients out. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for this demonstration. Uh, it's so great to have such a clear and concrete demonstration of how the health of our soils impacts so many other so many other things, including water, of course. Um, so now, friends, colleagues, allies, uh, this is already the end of our event. Um, wow, what an amazing couple of days it's been. Uh, we heard from incredible speakers, such inspiring and innovative stories. We got to meet each other and learn more about our respective initiatives and our perspectives. Uh, so thank you so very much for joining us and participating and being so engaged. That made the event really rich for all of us. I'll share a few of the main conclusions of the event. You know, from what I've gathered, uh, of course, a lot has been said, including in this last panel, but um, you know, I think it's, it's good that we leave the conference being connected to some of these main takeaway messages. Um, so the first one that's very clear in all of our minds at this stage, I believe, is really all of the benefits of soil regeneration. First of all, of course, carbon sequestration and climate mitigation, but also food security and the nutritional quality of our foods. Uh, the, the potential to restore biodiversity, the cleanliness of our waterways, improved water cycles, and resilience to extreme climate events. Now, of course, to achieve this, uh, all of these benefits, and to regenerate our soils, it was highlighted multiple times that the first thing that's needed is this paradigm shift, you know, the change in mentalities, because after all, this environmental issue we're discussing, as was raised recently, is first and foremost a human issue. It's a social issue. So we need to open up our minds to the change that's possible in order to move forward with the transition that's needed. Also uh, was highlighted the importance of peer-to-peer -peer learning and learning from other farmers. You know, this is such an important way for, for farmers to learn and uh, support networks are also crucial also for this sense of belonging and the, the feeling of support that is so needed. Um, you know, this brings me to an important point, which uh, you know, I was discussing with Paul earlier, is that farmers are really the ones in the field. They're the ones that are experimenting and that are gathering a lot of the knowledge and expertise. Um, and because agroecology is so context specific, this is why it's so important to foster exchanges between farmers so they can learn from one another. And this also highlights the importance of a, a bottom-up system in, instead of a top-down. So a system in which farmers are gathering this knowledge, this expertise, and are transferring it you know, to scientists and other stakeholders, as opposed to a system where you know, the, the scientists, in a top-down manner, might tell farmers what to do. We also need a training workforce. We need knowledge transfer. So this whole concept of training the trainers in order to have uh, more capacity to, to coach uh, farmers 
but that comes from farmer knowledge as well. Uh, also was highlighted, you know, the need for more collaboration between research, group, um, research groups to further our understanding of, of MRV solutions. Uh, we're brought up also a few different times, the need for a common definition of different things, you know, when we talk about soil health, what are we really talking about? The same with regenerative agriculture, and even peatlands was highlighted today. So, when we're talking about you know, advancing a sector, well, the first step is agreeing on what it is that we're talking about. So this is the, the joys of not having a, a headset today. <laughs> Apologies for this. Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, as we're all aware, and as was brought up multiple times, is the need for a multi-stakeholder approach. So engaging different kinds of stakeholders, um, like farmers, of course, who are at the center of the system, but NGOs who have this capacity of community organizing, businesses who can change their supply chain, policymakers who have a really important role to play to uh, create policies and incentives, um, and scientists, of course, as well, who can advance their, their scientific understanding and advanced research around this. And of course, you know, this brings me to, again, the importance of, of an event like today. Um, so it, it's really, really significant that you all came together and participated uh, in such big numbers to this event. So thank you once again. <laughs> thank you. So there are many people to thank for enabling this event to happen. Um, first, I'd like to thank again our event partners for making this possible. So the Finnish Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry through their Catch the Carbon program, the Strategic Research Council, EIT Food, the Magentor Nestling Foundation, Regional Council of Helsinki, and Moet Hennessy. Thank you all so much for your support. <laughs> And of course, a very special thank you to the organizers of this event, um, to the 4 per thousand initiative. You know, without you, we wouldn't be here. Uh, so thank you for your leadership in bringing together this network in the first place and empowering stakeholders to take action. Particularly, thank you to Paul for leading this organization since its beginnings. <laughs> thank you. And most special thank you to the Baltic Sea Action Group for really leading the way and taking the initiative to make this event happen in such a stellar manner with a beautiful, you know, seamless organization. So we're all really, really grateful. Um, so I want to thank Emma, Ona, Laura, of course, which uh, you have met. Um, and last but not least, we owe a very special thank you and congratulations to Elisa Vaino, uh, who's been wor working so hard for many, many months uh, to put this event together. Uh, there you are, I was looking for you. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for your dedication and for such incredible work in putting this event together. So please give a round of applause to Elisa. <laughs> Such incredible work. Thank you so much, Elisa. Um, and lastly, I want to say a warm thank you to all of you uh, for participating in this event. No matter where you came from, some people came from really far. And uh, it's really incredible that we had you know, 300 people on site in Helsinki and 300 people online. So such tremendous participation. Um, and I also want to highlight that, you know, we heard from amazing speakers in the last couple of days, but all of you in this room and online are experts in your own field. You all have experience and expertise and you're working every day around this issue. So I want to thank you for, I want to thank you all for your commitment to this cause of soil regeneration and for your important contributions for all of your work. Um, and just also to remind you that what you did in the last couple of days is really important, you know, so we really appreciate you taking time off of your work to, to convene here um, and to come learn and exchange. 
so thank you so much for this, and we really look forward to keeping in touch and to see the evolution of each one of your initiatives, because it's really through your collective work that we'll be able to achieve, to achieve significant change in terms of how our lands are managed to regenerate the health of, of our soils. So thank you all so much for this, and we really look forward to keeping in touch, and uh, it's not a goodbye, it's an au revoir. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you. And, and thank you for, for Gabriel for having chaired those two days with, I think, majesty and, uh, and well, always smiling. It, it's, it's, it's a pleasure to work with you, Gabriel. So that's the end. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll see in the field trip tomorrow. Yep. Many of you. So practical. not nice to say, but you have some practical. Practical. Info. Oh, Mrs. Okay. Practical. All right. Info. I'm sorry, Mrs. Practical Info still on stage. <laughs> After that, I mean, well, thanks. Uh, but uh, I have a couple of practical info because I have heard that you have asked about these a lot, so that's why I'm I'm still on stage. Uh, so those of you going to the field trips tomorrow, uh, I have sa just sent you again the confirmation email with the program and uh, where you should be tomorrow morning. I, ha I sent it again during the panel discussion, so it should be in your email. Uh, apologies for those few of you who have already cancelled. My list was not totally up to date, perhaps. But... Uh, unfortunately, we had the uh, field trips fully booked and even a bit overbooked, so we cannot take at this point any new people coming. So you have uh, got the email. And uh, the buses are not leaving from here, but they are leaving from the city center. So make sure that when you check your email, you check the link uh, to the map that is in the email. Uh, you can go to the city center directly with the tram number four, but you have to buy tickets in advance with the mobile app of uh, HSL. Uh, if you need more uh, help with this, I'm sure that if you are staying here, for example, here in Kalastajatorppa, the hotel reception will be happy to help you how to get to the center and how to find that Kiasma bus stop. And also, I guess, from other hotels. Um, yeah. Then I have been uh, also asked that uh, do we get the presentations from the speakers available for all of you to see in PDF format. So I will ask from all the speakers still uh, for their per permission and we will put them and we will let you know. So don't worry about it. It has been taken uh, into account. <laughs> and also if you want to, if you don't want to keep this as a souvenir, then you can uh, leave it to the information desk. And if you still have any questions uh, about the field trips, for example, um, you can meet us uh, in the registration desk when you are leaving this place. Thanks.